Ruth chapter 4. We've been looking at the book of Ruth here on Wednesday nights. I've been preaching really a series of messages. It's the fifth one. Tonight we'll wrap it up. A short series of messages dealing with the romance of redemption because the book of Ruth, like the book of Exodus, is a book of redemption. Exodus showing us the truth of the power behind redemption. Uh, Ruth is showing us uh, the love that was involved in it. Exodus is displaying the power of God involved in our translation from uh, being a child of the devil to becoming a child of God. Uh, as he illustrates that truth, bringing forth the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage through mighty signs and wonders and the plagues leading up to the uh, blood of the Passover being applied. And they escaped death literally going over the Red Sea on dry ground by faith. A passage for them that was secured by the breath of God, a pillar of cloud uh, by day, pillar of fire by night. They went through the cloud of dispersion, the waters of the Red Sea. All that speaking of the spiritual baptism and the uh, spiritual translation as you go through uh, Christ's death and burial and resurrection. Uh, of course, a uh, 100% process of the Spirit of God taking us uh, to become a new creature. Uh, of course, uh, all that is involved in the gracious act of redemption. Now, the book of Ruth deals with this truth in a much less dramatic way there. The subject of redemption is showing us our debt, our need, uh, our desperation, also showing us the importance of the choice in the matter. Uh, remember, Ruth was given an option while she was outside the land uh, here is a widowed woman suffering from the touch of death in her family. She's facing death. And, uh, and of course, uh, uh, what she looks at her people, she sees uh, a spiritual darkness. And she yet, given the option, she says, I will go. Just like Rebecca said, uh, when, when Eliezer, we believe, asked her the question, if she was willing, she said, I will go. And uh, here, of course, uh, the Bible shows us this was Ruth's decision. Where you go, I will go, she said. And uh, she claimed to uh, Naomi, her mother-in-law, who was going back to Bethlehem where she belonged. So Ruth had a choice. Uh, just like all sinners have a choice when it comes to the matter of redemption, uh, the price, of course, has already been paid. And uh, all that awaits is just an agreement between the sinner and the Lord. Now, for me, the matter was settled when I was just a teenager. And yet, to be technical, the matter was settled long ago, like the psalm says. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ made the choice when He said, Not my will, but thy will be done. And He chose in that act to freely give Himself in an act of worship and honor toward God the Father so that sinners could be redeemed. And when confronted with a choice myself many years later, what would I do with Jesus Christ uh, who made the choice for my redemption? Thank God I chose Him. And I chose right. Now the book of Ruth, as we've seen, also speaks to the great love wherewith God has loved us in this regard, uh, speaking of the Redeemer, showing us some great precious truths about Him in the person of Boaz. Uh, Boaz's name, as we've seen, means strength, means diligence, and in both aspects He points to Christ. Uh, for when it came to our redemption, Christ had the power and the strength to redeem us, and what's more, uh, He wouldn't rest until it was done meaning He went all the way through. Amen. He paid it all, like the song says, all to Him we owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but He washed it white as snow. And in chapter 1, there's recorded for us Ruth's sorrow. Uh, a death had come in the family, and she lost her father-in-law. Then she lost her brother-in-law, and even lost her own husband. That was Ruth's sorrow. Ruth makes the right choice to stick it out, as I said with Naomi. And uh, she does so really... No thanks to Naomi. <laughs> With no encouragement really there, given in chapter 1, it records Naomi's wrong decision to begin with. Uh, she left the place of blessing. She shouldn't have. Uh, she left the place of blessing. She went uh, from the place she belonged to a place she didn't belong. And we also see Naomi's wrong counsel. Uh, she has two daughters-in-law to go, uh, and, and they were with her, and yet she encourages them, don't bother going with her. She's telling them not to leave with her. Uh, all she could see at that point in time was that God's hand was against her. And that's why the Bible counsels us, saying that we're not to despise the Lord's chastisement. Uh, the Lord chastens us, and it's for our good. Uh, he, he scourgeth every son he receiveth. And it's an act of God's love whenever He chastens us and He corrects us. 
But Naomi couldn't see that at that point. And so what you see also in chapter 1 is Naomi's wrong attitude. She makes a wrong decision. She gives wrong counsel. She has a wrong attitude. And still yet Ruth, looking back at her own heritage, looking at the paganism of her own people that she naturally belonged to, uh, she knows there's no hope for her if she stays there. And in the context of Ruth's sorrow, she chose right. Chapter 2 speaks of Ruth's service. Uh, she, she is uh, choosing uh, not only to go, but once she's there, she chooses to go to the fields. Uh, everyone, amen, every one of us that have been saved, despite the Jewish people being a people who have suffered uh, God's judgment and wrath, uh, a people who as a whole uh, had walked away from God, rejected His laws, even rejected God's Son, despite their having made wrong decisions and giving wrong counsel, and even now, uh, for the most part, possessing a wrong attitude. <laughs> Yet by the ministry of the Spirit of God, by the ministry of the light of the Word, we look to Israel for the truth of God's Word. And we look to Israel for the Savior that they rejected. Now think about that. That's where we get our scriptures. We get it from the Jewish people. We get our Savior from Israel. Amen. After they as a people had rejected both, we chose the King of the Jews to be our Savior. And uh, from there we learned to go to the fields in order that we might serve Him. Ruth's service in chapter 2 shows how God guides Ruth and leads her in His providence to the very field of Boaz. Then Boaz, knowing her choice that she has made, he beholds her labor in the field and he shows great kindness to her. Remember what he tells her? He tells her in that respect, he says, don't go to another field. And of course, that's a message all in itself. A field there that we're in serving the Lord. The Lord says, you stick with that field. You continue to serve me. Thank you, Brother Jack. And the fact is, folks, that when we're serving the Lord, we need to just continue serving the Lord. Continue being faithful. Now, Naomi, she learns there while she's in Boaz's field, uh, she starts to su suspect he's taking a shine to her. And, uh, and he shows grace to her. And when she goes back, she's got that bounty and that blessing that he's just heaped upon her for her and Naomi. And Naomi, she says, where have you been, girl? Where'd you get all this? And she begins to explain how she ended up in the field of Boaz. And at that point, you begin to see a different outlook for Naomi. She begins to see God's hand involved in all this there. And she gives her counsel. And by chapter 3, we see Ruth's surrender there as her sorrow leads her to a selection, a choice if you will. That choice leads to her serving in the fields. By chapter 3, she is led to a further surrender. She submits to the counsel of Naomi and then submits to Boaz and then has to wait on Boaz to work on her behalf and the behalf of Naomi. Now all this is where we're at tonight. Uh, this is the message I'm preaching this evening from chapter 4. I'm preaching on Ruth's satisfaction. Ruth's satisfaction. She who selected Naomi, served in the field, surrendered to Boaz, here finds satisfaction with Boaz. A woman who when the record begins is in a pagan, idolatrous land, naturally connected to a people outside of God's covenants and promises, uh, condemned by God. She ends up, by the end of the record, she's got her own relationship with God. And she's bought and redeemed and joined to Boaz. And what do we know? She's in the family of Jesus Christ. That's the record here. Like the old hymn says, love found a way. I don't know if you've ever heard that song, but it's written by Avis Christensen. She wrote thousands of poems there. Began when she was just a teenage girl. She wrote a few hymns as well. She wrote that one around 100 years ago, maybe exactly 100 years ago, 1918, A Song of Redemption. She wrote, Wonderful love that rescued me, sunk deep in sin, guilty and vile as I could be, no hope within. When every light had, had fled, O oh, glorious day, raising my soul from out the dead, love found a way. She wrote the second verse, Love brought my Savior here to die on Calvary. For such a sinful wretch as I, how could it be? Love bridged the gulf which me in heaven taught me to pray. I am redeemed, set free, forgiven. For love found a way. And then the third verse, she said, Love opened wide the gates of light to heaven's domain, where in eternal power and might Jesus shall reign. Love lifted me from depths of woe to endless day. There was no help in earth below, but love found a way. 
And that's the story of how we came to know Jesus Christ. Love found a way. Back in chapter 3, what led to Ruth's surrender was instruction she received from Naomi about Boaz. Uh, Boaz, Boaz is someone because of his love for their family and, and of course, uh, more particularly, his attraction now to Ruth. He's interested in them both. Uh, he's one that we see he gets involved in, and he's one who becomes an instrument in their redemption and effectively their rescue. Uh, Ruth here, the privacy of the moment of chapter 3, uh, in a very personal way, she shows that submission uh, that she's been counseled toward as she finds her way to Boaz and at his feet. She presents herself at his feet. And that's where we left off. She comes to the feet of Boaz uh, learning that with Boaz. Here's somebody. Here is somebody who has the right relationship. Meaning he's a kinsman redeemer. He's got the right relationship uh, to, to Elimelech. And he has the right resources. Uh, the Bible tells us he's a mighty man in wealth. Uh, he has great riches. And, and he has the right resolve. Uh, when there's something right, uh, he's the kind of man that's going to do it. He's going to make sure it's done right. And he had shown his interest in Ruth. Now is up to her to show her interest in him. And she does so going and humbling herself at his feet. Boaz is a type of Christ. Ruth is a type of the church. Naomi represents, among other things, a picture of the repentant and the restoration of a remnant of the people of Israel. Jewish believers who get right. So back in chapter 3, there's a picture of the church and she's presenting herself to someone who's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's Ruth presenting herself to Boaz. And given our condition and his position, the only way to present ourselves, folks, is at his feet. You know what she wants? She, she wants to join him. She wants to be married. And she goes and she shows her interest there. Now, Ruth, the text shows us, uh, before this happens, she washes herself. She washes herself, meaning she gets cleaned up. Amen. You want to meet with God, you got to get cleaned up. Amen. I'm, I'm asking God to bless this meeting coming up. I tell you, I'm getting stagnant. It's not because I'm not prayed up, I am. It's not because I'm not read up, I am. But sometimes, just because it's a rotten flesh, we can even get used to the high privilege and honor of serving God. I get in the pulpit and the Lord helps me, but just out there, day-to-day -day stuff, it can become mundane. And I don't like that, and I know this, the Lord doesn't like it either. And so I'm praying the Lord will meet with us and the Lord will he'll, he'll visit us, amen, in a special way during this meeting. But I know this, as she's getting ready to meet the Lord of the harvest, she has to get cleaned up. And, and Ruth gets cleaned up and then she anoints herself with some smell goods and changes her raiment, changes her garment. See, in all that, she's just getting ready to meet the Master. The Lord of the harvest there, uh, who's already shown His grace to her. Uh, Ruth shows her commitment. She does exactly what she's told to do. And then there's her condescension as she humbles herself. And she takes her position at His feet. And then, as I said, there's her cleansing. She gets cleaned up. She knows she's about to meet the, the one who's her Redeemer. And so she gets cleaned up. And there's her consecration. as That's what the anointing and the putting on of all that smell good. That's what that points to, it speaks to us in the New Testament of walking in love as Christ also hath loved us and given Himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling Savior. That's a life of consecration. Now the Bible draws our attention to her clothing, her garments, even a changing of raiment there signifying to us that we're to pull on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Ruth had worn the garments of a widow. She had worn the garments of a worker out in the field. But by chapter 3, she's looking for a future husband. And so she's not going to wear the garment she's been working in the field in. She's going to dress appropriately. And you and I, we start really getting ready to meet the Lord and see our bridegroom. And man, it's going to make a change in how we present ourselves spiritually. And putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. To praise the Lord, we need to, we need to think about that. He's the Lord of our harvest. And then here in chapter 3... We see emphasized her conduct. If you look back there, uh, just up there in verse 3, just she's told to wash, anoint, put her raiment on, find out where he's lying down, and then go. And she says, once you find it out, she says, uh, uh, he'll tell thee what thou shalt do. Verse 5, and she said unto her, all that thou sayest unto me, I will do. Well, now that's the means, that needs to be our attitude right there. All that you say, I'll do. And once she's discovered by Boaz, he awakes in his sleep and finds her there. You know what she's doing? She's enjoying His rest. 
You need to get a hold of that. She's enjoying His rest. He's resting. He wakes up and it says there, verse 9, He said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, I am handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter. For thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requirest. For all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. Again, a type of the church there. Proverbs chapter uh, 31 and now it's true that I am a near kinsman, howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I. Tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning, that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman's part. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of a kinsman to thee, as the Lord liveth. Lie down until the morning. And she lay at his feet until the morning, and she rose up before one could know another. And he said, Let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. Again, this is all... Pure. There's nothing carnal going on here. Uh, he's making sure her testimony's intact. And also he said, uh, Bring the veil that thou hast upon thee and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her and she went into the city. That's called an earnest. Amen. He's, he's, not, he's not pushing her off. He's not putting her away. He's not you know, letting her think something's going to happen when nothing's going to happen. He shows her he's serious about the things he said. And it says, when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Who art thou, my daughter? Now, she knows this is Ruth. The question she's asking, are you, are you Mrs. Boaz now? <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> What's happened? And, and, he, and she told her all that the man had done to her. And she said, These six measures of barley gave he me. For he said to me, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. Then said she, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall. For the man will not be in rest until he have finished the thing this day. And at the feet of the kinsman redeemer there, the, the Lord of the harvest, Ruth sees that possibility. That's what got her to go. You know, there, there, there's something that, that Naomi has told her. There's a possibility of a new home. There's a possibility of a new hope. There's a possibility of a new happiness. That life don't have to be a dead end. Uh, it can mean something. And, and so she goes and presents herself at his feet. And there's, there's a time of research there. As he awakes and sees her there, there's an inquiry made. There's an investigation. There's resolved involved in that as well. And also involved is a great request. So there's a presentation at his feet because of the possibilities that existed. Also there's the promises she sees. He receives her. He reassures her. And, and I like this. He rejoices because of her. Uh, think about that. Uh, that's what we read in chapter 3. She's being rescued. Basically, what will amount to her rescue is put into motion. And her Redeemer uh, is only too glad to rescue her. He rejoices. When he raises up and he sees her and she tells him who she is, he rejoices that she's there at his feet. Think about it. Uh, all this history has given us to show some insight to the truth of redemption. And in redemption, everything's got to be done right. And, and what, we, what we learn here is that the Lord rejoices to be our Redeemer. He rejoices that we trust Him. He rejoices that we came to Him. We didn't go to religion. He, he rejoices in the fact we didn't trust ourselves. We trusted Him. And, and from the redemption of our souls to the redemption of our bodies, God will be just. He doesn't have to violate any principle. He doesn't have to violate His nature. Uh, God is just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. In all that God has established in the way of salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ, as I've said before, the scales are balanced in Christ. It is the only way of salvation. The scales aren't balanced in religion. The scales aren't balanced in good works. The scales are only balanced when our sins are paid for and the righteousness we don't have is provided and that's provided in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God gave His Son so that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. And He does nothing out of order. He doesn't cut corners. He doesn't do things in a sham sort of way. He's just. And He's going to do it right. And here Boaz has been confronted with the opportunity to redeem the Limelech's property. And he has the wealth to redeem it. He can buy it for himself. He has opportunity to take it. And, and there's a, the widowed son 
uh, the widow daughter-in-law of Elimelech there has presented herself to him there to, in order to raise up memory for the dead. Boaz wants to redeem this pop property. He's able to redeem this property. And more than that, he's taken with Ruth and he wants her for his bride. But despite what he wants, and despite his own desires and his own wishes, everything's going to be done right. Everything's going to be done proper. And there's a kinsman, he knows, that's nearer than him. And uh, as I said before, that could represent the law of God. But also, of course, such a, represents God the Father when you think about it. The, the law of God, it's His law. And given, given for His wife, uh, we know this, there's the nation of Israel. That's His bride, right? Right? Amen. <laughs> that is God the Father's bride is the nation of Israel. The Jewish people, there's a promise for them in restoration. There's a times of restoration. There's covenants and there's promises that were made to them. And even though they came up short in every covenant God promised, as we read about it in Scripture, yet in Christ, He's the Lord God of Shem. He, he's the seed of Abraham. He's the son of David, the line of Judah, the star of Jacob, the Holy One of Israel. And there has been no shortcoming in Him. The King of the Jews. And so a new covenant was promised to the houses of Israel and the house of Judah and the power behind this new covenant we read about in the book of Hebrews is the power of an endless life. The priest that will live forever who represents them. Amen. The power of an endless life. That's the power behind this new covenant. And the blood of the new covenant is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And so in the very giving of a new covenant that was promised to both houses of Israel and Judah, you have a picture of the gospel of Christ. His blood and an endless life. Amen. He shed His blood in His death and then He rose again and He ever lives to make intercession for them that trust Him. Now the law and the old covenant could not redeem as there's nothing, anything there for the Gentiles. We know that. We're strangers and covenants. We're outside aliens from all that God promised to the children of Israel. There's nothing there for us. And with that in mind, we see here in chapter 4, Verse 1, Then went Boaz up to the gate and set him down there. And behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, Ho, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. Now what's going on, this is a legal proceeding. It's how it was, it was handled in this time. There's no city hall. There's no county courthouse. Uh, legal matters were handled in the gate of the city. They get that from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 16, verse 18 says, Judges and officers shalt thou make thee in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee throughout all the tribes. They shall judge the people with a just judgment. And they met there at the gates. So in these towns are town elders deciding issues and they're making rulings, the Bible says, quote, in the fear of God. And they're doing this based on the written law of God, according to 2 Chronicles chapter 19, verses 5 to 10. So verse 2 says, and he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. So here's ten men. Ten men right here. And, and ten, if you know Bible numerology, ten represents Gentiles. That's our number. Amen. <laughs> ten is us. Now Genesis 10, that's the table of the Gentile nations. Acts 10, that's the first group of Gentiles that get preached at. Uh, there in, in, in Acts chapter 10. And then of course Romans 10, that's the missionary call for Gentiles. And it goes on and on and on. And so that covers Ruth. But again, that's what she is. She's a Gentile woman. Besides the ten elders called there, there's also Boaz. And there's the nearer kinsman. So that's twelve. And twelve speaks to Israel. Twelve patriarchs, twelve apostles. And so that pertains to Naomi. Again, the truth being given here is about redemption. And redemption, friend, there's a redemption that speaks of the church... And there's redemption that speaks of the nation of Israel as well. Verse 3, He said unto the kinsman, Naomi that is come out of the country of Moab, selleth the parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, this is where the word comes from, I thought to advertise thee, saying, buy it. And that's what redemption is. Redemption is a buying. Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. Now what we notice here is at this point, 
Boaz has mentioned the property of Elimelech, and uh, that's Naomi's debt included and all that she's trying to sell out there. And uh, God in the law had commanded them to keep it all in the family, and that's what they're trying to do. But he hasn't mentioned anything about Ruth yet. He hadn't brought her up. She's a Gentile widow. So the, the first kinsman is willing until, until she gets brought up. And there's the problem, verse 5. Then said Boaz, What day that thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. So uh, here, here's... A picture, we could say, of the law of God and the grace of God, you might say. But, but actually, here's God the Father and God the Son. As there's only one nearer kinsman, amen, there's only one nearer than Christ. And that's the Father. But God has a bride. He has a Jewish bride, and she's His inheritance. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 32, 9, the Lord's portion is His people. Jacob is the lot of His inheritance. Then again over there in Psalms 33, 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom He hath chosen for His own inheritance. I know around July the 4th we like to preach on that, but that's not America. <laughs> that's the nation of Israel. That's who He's talking about. And there, there are several other references that show the relationship that God has with Israel. They are His inheritance. And the law, the law, which was the law of God, forbade bringing in a Moabite into their inheritance. According to Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 3 through 6, it would mar their inheritance until the 10th generation. But again, all this is showing that the near kinsman could not mar his inheritance, and so it all passes on to Boaz. Boaz, a type of Christ. And the truth that's being presented behind the scenes in all this for us Gentiles is, is Romans 8 3. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Amen. Love found a way. Amen. We didn't have a thing to do with the law. Again, you don't, you don't win somebody to Christ and try to get them under the law, especially if they're Gentile, because their people were never under the law. The law was given to the Jewish people. It has nothing to do with the Gentiles. But we do have a stake in God through Jesus Christ. If we'll trust Him, we have access to to the Lord there. The near kinsman would like to redeem the property of Elimelech that pertains to Naomi, but he can't redeem Ruth because he has a bride. He has a Jewish bride. Now, Boaz don't. Boaz is a single man. He's not going to dishonor a Jewish bride by taking a Gentile wife. It won't mar his inheritance. And so it says in verse 7, uh, Now this was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing for to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor. And this was a testimony in Israel. Now it's just a, a symbol. Uh, there's, a, there's a sign there of a, of a financial responsibility from one hand to the other, if you will. Uh, the shoe speaking of obligation and responsibility, even willingness, I suspect. Uh, that comes from Deuteronomy chapter 25. That's where you read about it there. The shoe is taken off and given to the one uh, who would redeem, the one who wouldn't redeem, takes his shoe off, and the one that uh, that didn't get redeemed, spit in his face. Now, <laughs> that doesn't happen here. <laughs> and so that, that's the law from Deuteronomy 25, but Ruth doesn't spit in the face of the near kinsman uh, who won't redeem her because there's a reason he won't redeem her. He said it cannot. It would mar his inheritance. The law would not allow him to do this. And so he couldn't do it. But Boaz is single. He's unmarried. As I said, he can take Ruth as his wife. And he's not violating the rights of a Jewish bride. Verse 8, Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe. You know what he's doing? He's, he's giving him that shoe and he's saying to him, You do it. You do it. I can't. You do it. And again, folks, that's God in type. Commissioning Christ to redeem a people called out for His name's sake. And that'd be me and you and everybody else that's saved. Uh, it says in Isaiah, in the light of the incarnation of Christ, it says, Isaiah 49.5, uh, 
Uh, now saith the Lord that formed me out of the womb to be his servant. This is the incarnation of Christ. A body hast thou prepared me, he said in Hebrews. And in speaking of that, the true Israel of God is Jesus Christ in Isaiah 49. And you can see that in that passage because Israel is going to redeem Jacob. And Israel, the prince with God, is Christ in the passage. Coming out of the, uh, the as a polished shaft, he's uh, a heritage to the Lord, the servant of God commissioned. And he said, Thou saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. This is Christ speaking. And he said, Christ said, God the Father said to me, He said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give for thee the light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. That's a conversation taking place between God the Father and God the Son. And what he's saying there is he's saying you're going to be the salvation for the people of Israel. But that's just a light thing. You're going to be my salvation to the ends of the earth. And that's said in Isaiah 49 over 700 years before Jesus is born. And Jesus is speaking, talking about His own incarnation in that conversation. God gloried in His servant who is His Son, bringing about salvation and redemption to the uttermost parts of the world. Verse 9 of chapter 4 says, Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon's of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. Again, God ordained that in the law in order to give you and I a hint towards the resurrection. He ordained that. He said, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up, the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his place. Ye are witnesses this day. And in buying all this, pictured redemption, he is, he is receiving what they owed. He's taking on their debt. And he's uh, also receiving what they own. He's taking on their earnings, their wages. That's what Christ did for us in redemption. <laughs> Speaking of our sin, that's our debt, Right? And our works, that's our wages. <laughs> Amen. The wages. Wages is what you get for working. And the wages of sin is death. Folks, we were in debt, but more than that, we had earned damnation. We had earned destruction, and Christ took care of our debt, and He took care of our earnings too. When He went to the cross, verse 11 says, And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman that has come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which too did build the house of Israel. And do thou worthily in Ephrathah, and be famous in Bethlehem. And let thy house be like the house of Pharez, whom Tamar bare unto Judah of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. Now being bought with a price uh, is not just uh, a dowry for a bride, although that, that's certainly part of it, but it's also the payment for a slave. That's what redemption speaks to us of. We are His bride. We were, quote, sold under sin. The wages of sin is death. We are under condemnation. And the Redeemer bought us. He bought us by His blood. We're not our own. And in this scene here, these witnesses, they're there to behold this transaction. And those witnesses, they go on to speak of Rachel and Leah. Talking about the two that God used to build the house of Israel. And uh, Rachel and Leah, like their aunt Rebecca who we know obviously is a type of the church, Rachel and Leah, they're all connected. All three ladies are connected to Laban, right? Right? Everybody's read that? <laughs> Laban's the Syrian. These are Syrian women. They're Gentiles. And then also mentioned is Tamar. Tamar's another Gentile woman. So all in some form and fashion pictured for us the Gentile bride of Jesus Christ. The church, which is largely made up of Gentile converts. Verse 13 says, So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel, and he shall be unto thee 
a restorer of thy life and a nourisher of thine old age for thy daughter-in-law which loveth thee which is better to thee than seven sons hath borne him. And remember wait, when we were back in chapter 1 these same women when they were saying is that Naomi? You know what she said to him? She said don't call me Naomi. Don't call, Naomi meant blessed. She said don't call me Naomi. She said call me Mara for the Lord hath dealt bitterly with me. She's not talking like that now. <laughs> Amen. Things have went a hundred miles from that situation. God has been involved and He has done some things. He's turned everything right side up. Keep in mind, all this is happening in Bethlehem. Amen. Uh, regardless of the history of this event, there's the prophetical value. Amen. We're looking back, but in looking back, we realize God was pointing forward. <laughs> Micah chapter 5, verse 2 says, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Pointing to the birth of Christ and the city He was going to be born in. Then it says down there in verse 16, Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom and became nurse unto it. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name saying, There's a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Pharez. Pharez begot Hezron. Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Aminadab. And Aminadab begot Nashon. Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz. Boaz begot Obed. Obed begot Jesse. And Jesse begot David. And we know on down the line, by the time you come to the New Testament, that's the line that Jesus Christ comes from. So here's Boaz, whose name points to Christ in strength and diligence. Then there's Obed, whose name means servant. You go back and you see all the passages in the book of Isaiah where Christ is the prophesied servant. And then he has Jesse, whose name means God is a gift. A gift. And then there's David, whose name means beloved. All of it. The whole record, folks, is the Spirit of God rolling out the red carpet for the coming of Jesus Christ. That's the way the whole Old Testament's written. And here in chapter 4, what we see is a summons where there's a gathering of elders, and there's Boaz, and there's the near kinsman. And following this summons, there's a symbol as the near kinsman removes his shoe because he cannot redeem Ruth. He gives it to Boaz. And then the record gives us the account of the son. There's a child born. and speaks of the fruitfulness of Ruth and the faithfulness of God. And then the account gives us a summary. Ruth in sorrow and selection. He mentioned her sorrow led to her selection, a choice. She made a choice. That choice led to her service. Her service eventually led to her surrendering and submitting to God. And then, of course, in the end, she's satisfied. She gets all that she needs to live happily ever after. <laughs> That's what we're reading about here. We're reading about God touching a person's life. Everything was upside down at the beginning. By the time it ends up, it's right side up. The Lord blesses our choices when we choose right. Again, that's the great story behind the book of Ruth. A song, love found a way. The chorus was love found a way to redeem my soul. Love found a way that could make me whole. Love sent my Lord to my cross of shame. Love found a way. Oh, praise His holy name. And I don't know where you're at right now after we get through this book together. Some of, there may be somebody here tonight who needs to, needs to choose. You've yet to choose the Lord Jesus Christ. And there may be somebody here, you've chosen Christ, but you're not in the fields. You're not serving Him in the fields. And there may be somebody who's serving Him in the fields, but you're not at His feet. You're not surrendered. You're not submitted to Him. And the end of all this, when we go the right course, leads to satisfaction. You and I finding all that we need in Jesus Christ. Folks, that's a fact. Folks that thinks it's in money, that they had the money they were looking for, find out it's not in the money. Folks that think it's in things, find out if they got the things, it's not in the things. Folks that thinks it's in the family, thank God for family, I'm all for it. But once you have the family, you realize if God wasn't in it, that wouldn't be anything but a burden. That's a fact. Friends, whatever you think life's all about, you know what you find out in the end? It's not about that. The only thing going to satisfy us, our longings, our yearnings, is the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll bless the little that we have or the lot that we have. 
He'll bless the relationships we have and relationships we don't have. He'll fill in the gaps. He'll fill in the points. He's all in all, folks. Love has found a way. And you and I, we're cheating ourselves when we're living for something else or someone else other than the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you to stand. Every head bowed. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. And tonight, maybe maybe somebody needs to come and say, I'm going to work in the fields. I've chosen right. The Lord's my Savior, but I'm not working in the fields. Or maybe somebody say, well, I'm working in the fields, but I, too often do I find myself not at His feet. I don't surrender myself. I'm not submitted to Him in that regard. I'm having a problem waiting on Him. Wherever we're at, we need to, we need to get where we're at and do the, do the next step. Maybe there's somebody here. You're here and you've never been saved. Uh, you need to choose. You've got a choice to make. It's not religion. It's not you turning over a new leaf. It's Him. The Lord Jesus Christ who paid for your sin and took your wages and settled the debt and got up from the dead. And now through the power of an endless life, all you need is found in Jesus Christ in that new covenant. You need Him. Whatever your need is, He's the answer. Father, Thank you for the opportunity to preach tonight. I pray, Lord God, you'll bless the truth that's been spoken. And bear witness to it, Lord God. And. Uh...